مشاهدي الكرام من العاصمة الباكستانية إسلام أباد نحييكم في هذه المقابلة الخاصة ومعنا ضيف هذه الليلة رئيس الوزراء الباكستاني السيد عمران خان Mr. Prime Minister, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. Mr. Prime Minister, the Saudi Crown Prince's first stop in his Asian tour was Islamabad. And he will be treated as a leader, beginning with yourself uh, receiving him in your own personal car and ending with uh, being uh, decorated by the Pakistan's highest medal uh, in Pakistan. How do you see that? Uh, well, let me first say that people of Pakistan have always, always felt this special relationship with Saudi Arabia. And that relationship has two dimensions to it. One is Mecca and Medina. So whatever happens, Mecca and Medina, you know, it's, a, it's in their hearts. And Saudi Arabia is that country. So every Pakistani uh, Muslim wants to go to Mecca and Medina. Uh, and so therefore, that's one relationship. So whatever happens, we will always have this uh, a relationship of the heart with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. Secondly, Saudi Arabia has stood by Pakistan in some of our most difficult times. Uh, most, of our, most of the times we have created our bad times because of our bad policies. But then there have been other times when um, devastation, war, uh, um, earthquake, floods, you know, natural disasters that occur, always Saudi Arabia has been a friend. So therefore, we have this special relationship with Saudi Arabia. And to have the crown prince coming to Pakistan, I can assure you that he will get the best welcome. People really are looking forward to his visit. Mr. Prime Minister, more than nine MOUs will be, have been signed uh, during his visit. Uh, during the Crown Prince's visit, and which is worth about $32 billion uh, and investments in, in, in is everywhere in Pakistan. Uh, where is the Saudi-Pakistan relationship going to the new era, as the Foreign Minister described it? What we want to do, wh why we say it's a, it's a new era, it's, a, it's time for a, a new level of relationship, is because we want to have uh, play to each other's comparative advantage. Pakistan has uh, a different type of advantage to Saudi Arabia. We have probably, uh, even today, the most educated Muslims in the world are Pakistanis. Most of them are eight to nine million Pakistanis are abroad, expatriate Pakistanis. But amongst them are scientists. Uh, in every field, Pakistanis excel working abroad. So we have... Uh, human capital in every field. So Pakistan is the only Muslim country that had the capacity, the, the ability to build a nuclear bomb, nuclear reactors, missile technology. So in a lot of ways, Pakistan is ahead of the other Muslim countries. Saudi Arabia has capital. It has oil. Uh, Pakistan has entrepreneurship, businessmen in different areas. We have labor. So. You know, we can, uh, the two, if we, if we play on each other's advantage, the, the different advantages both uh, countries have, we can then, both countries can benefit. And what level do you want to reach when you're saying we want to reach, raise it to a higher level? Higher level means trading, uh, investing in each other's, uh, where both countries benefit. If you have strong trading partners, then both countries gain. I remember that in European Union, when uh, people, and I was in university in England when European Union was formed, but all the member states, their standard of living went up because they opened up the trade. The more they traded, the more the standard of living went up. Similarly, I think Saudi Arabia and Pakistan need to look beyond the relationship which we had in the past. We trade, we invest with each other, we do joint ventures. And I think it will raise the standard of living in both countries. Pakistan has invited Saudi Arabia to be part, or the, as a third party, in the CPEC uh, project. Why choose Saudi Arabia? What role uh, do you want Saudi Arabia to play as a third party? Well, what is CPEC? CPEC is basically connect, a connectivity with China. China now, 
is the fastest growing economy in the world and we all know that at the rate China is growing, in the next 10 years it will even overtake the US. It's the second biggest economy right now. It's predicted to be the biggest economy. Uh, CPEC connects Pakistan with China. And along the CPEC, we are uh, in the process of uh, developing special economic zones. That's where Saudi Arabia stands to benefit by participating in these special economic zones. Because then it has this access to China benefiting from uh, uh, these special economic zones with special uh, benefits. So um, that's what Pakistan wants to do. It wants to invite uh, its friends from UAE, from, uh, from Saudi Arabia to invest here. Very good. What kind of benefits are we, are we talking about? What will they gain? I think the special economic zones will have one window oper operations. They will be isolated from the bureaucratic uh, uh, red tape. It'll just be easier to invest. It'll be, um, uh, you know, the facilities will be provided there. There will be uh, concessions, maybe a, a less, uh, lower taxes. So that all that framework is being developed. And so the idea is that if South, here's an opportunity for Saudi Arabia. And then they have the whole, the biggest market of China. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, basically one of the main concerns of any investor in, in, in entering any market is the taxes. Are there any plans or promises to reduce the tax rate for so Saudi investors who uh, are willing to invest in Pakistan? Let me just give you my philosophy. How has Pakistan changed when we say Nya Pakistan? How, is, how has that changed? Unfortunately, in Pakistan, from the 70s onwards, a socialist mindset came in. Um, the one aspect of socialism is great, where you, you feel that uh, uh, growth should be equitable. It should not be rich getting richer and poor getting poorer, but it should be uh, the wealth creation should be spread out so that you, know, you lift people from the bottom tier. But the other problem we had with uh, the s sort of socialist government we had in the 70s is that it nationalized everything. And that nationalization affected our growth rate. It affected wealth creation. It affected uh, the, uh, the, the way Pakistan was rising up. We had entrepreneurs, we had uh, banking families. Uh, uh, we, were, we were growing faster than any country um, in the region. But what the, the thing that affected Pakistan the most of all was this m mindset that making money was a sin, that it was a crime to, uh, to, to, to make big profits. It's a crime to make profits when, when you don't pay your taxes and when you do not uh, uh, help in, uh, a society doesn't help in lifting its poor people up. Like China, China lifted 700 million people out of poverty in 30 years. They made money, but, the, but that money was shared at, uh, to lift the bottom people up. Now, um, uh, unfortunately in Pakistan, this mindset came that, you know, it was a crime to make a lot of money. And so that affected the whole way the bureaucracy functioned, the political class functioned, and the whole atmosphere was against profit making. What we want to do now is to allow investors to make money. We would want them to make profits because if they make profits, more people will come and invest. And, and people only, I mean, you don't do business for charity, you do business to make money. And so we, we will allow, we will create the conditions so people can make money. How, I'm sorry, I'm going to take you back to the taxes again. How about for the Saudi goods? Are, they're also high, sometimes reaching from 28 to 50 percent high. Are there any plans to change those rates? No, I'm still, so, so, so I come back to it. Clearly, we want them to make money. So if we'll, if they won't be able to make money if the taxes are too high. So that'll be part of it, and other ways we will facilitate them. The whole idea is to facilitate our investors. And when the investors do well, other people flock to, uh, to invest in your country. There are voices who said that uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan uh, chosen Saudi Arabia to be his first international uh, visit because 
he was desperate or Pakistan was desperate for loans. How do you challenge that? Yeah, that's true. I mean, Pakistan, uh, the Pakistan we inherited, we, uh, the, the, what the government left behind, the previous government, was bankrupt. We had a, a really bad balance of payment situation. And uh, we, we would have defaulted. We didn't have uh, enough money to pay for our service, our debts, or for our imports. And when one is in that situation, one goes to one's friends. So, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and UA were, and China, there were three countries which we felt were our friends. And I must say, none of those three countries let us down. They helped us. So that's what friends are for. Uh, of course, you don't want to keep going back to friends for loans. What we want, what we hope now is that the reform process which we have set in will gradually uh, enable us to get out of this debt trap. And we will, Pakistan will, inshallah, make, uh, uh, we will uh, have such growth rate, wealth creation, that we will never have to go and borrow money. How and does we hope. The Pakistan, and I mean Pakistan by both the government and the people, how do they react towards countries which rejected the demand of Pakistan to, for loans and financial support? Actually, we only went for three countries. We only decided to go to China because China has stood us, with us through all our bad times. Uh, uh, UAE, uh, you know, both, and Saudi Arabia, who, with, there's a lot of Pakistanis working in UAE and Saudi Arabia who have, over the past, maybe not in the uh, UAE in the past 10 years, but in the old times have always been uh, good to us. So we only went to these three countries, and all three countries, I must say, I must thank them, they didn't let us down. And did you go with confidence that you'll not be let down? Well, you never know. I mean, you know, I'm, it's not, I've only been uh, in this chair for six months, so I can't say what others would have thought. But we, we worked out, we thought, uh, which other countries in this uh, difficult time would help us? And so our, 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 the, our cabinet um, all felt that these are the three countries we should ask for, and all three countries uh, gave us loans. And also our, we, are, we have future investment projects with them. Now, back again to what you mentioned about the missiles and the military uh, field. Uh, as uh, Saudi Crown Prince is uh, coming in, 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 in Islamabad. Will there be, military-wise, will there be more uh, further kind of uh, relations or mutual understandings, MOUs, and military-wise between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia? Uh, Saudi Arabia, with Makkah and Medina there. I can assure you that, uh, forget our military, the people of Pakistan would want to defend Saudi Arabia if anything happens to them. So that you can rest assured. But you see, Pakistan, what, what the role we want to play now is that we want to play the role of a, a country that brings other countries together. This whole division uh, uh, in the Muslim world, Muslims fighting Muslims, uh, you know, all the, uh, in the, you just look back in the last 15 years, the devastation that has taken place in the mus Muslim world. Uh, the last thing we want is uh, more conflicts. Pakistan wants to play the role, and Pakistan can play the role because Pakistan has probably one of the best um, uh, militaries. We are a nuclear armed country. We have uh, a, a, a military that just won us a very difficult war on terror where you know almost 70,000 Pakistanis, over 70,000 Pakistanis lost their lives. But we, great intelligence agencies, a, a strong military. But we want to play the role of bringing countries together. We would like to uh, play a role with, uh, with Saudi Arabia, putting out fires in the Muslim world, getting countries together. You know, it's unfortunate the, uh, the conflict, uh, the, the bad blood between um, Saudi Arabia and Iran. We would like to play a role there. Yemen, definitely, it's a, it's a very, it's a conflict that is consuming uh, resources. It's, I, I, it could go on and on, and a lot of human suffering. Just like now, Pakistan is playing its role in bringing an end 
or trying to get this conciliation in Afghanistan with, with uh, you know, with uh, helping uh, the, the U.S. and the Taliban get on the dialogue table, getting a peace pros process going, getting somehow a government of uh, 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 political reconciliation somehow uh, to end this conflict of 17 years. So I think that is the role which we want to play. And sorry, back again to the military. Will we be seeing the GF-17 in the Saudi Air Force, maybe? Well, let's see, uh, you know, uh, we are quite proud that, you know, we have manufactured this, uh, this jet. And uh, yes, we, let's see, it depends on uh, uh, the Crown Prince and the Saudi government. Mr. Prime Minister, in an earlier statement made by you, you said ref reforms are painful. What pain will the Pakistanis face in your vision of, ref of re reform? Always reforms are painful. A problem Pakistan faces is we have huge deficits which we inherited from the previous government. Record fiscal deficit, re record current, affair, uh, current account deficit. And when you have that sort of deficits, um, and to correct that imbalance, you have to make reforms. You have to, uh, in cutting down your fiscal deficits, you have to reform your tax machinery. You have to be able to raise your revenues and cut down your expenditures to balance your budget. And that, that's painful. You know, you, you can't have reforms without pain. Uh, hoping to have reforms without pain is like, uh, as someone said, wanting to go, heaven, to, go to heavens without dying. You have to have pain, you know, to, um, uh, when, when things are out of balance. But, you know, if people feel that, you know, they will, for a while, they will uh, go through this pain, and the pain is shared, it's just not that the poor people are uh, uh, hurting and a small elite is enjoying life. If everyone uh, sacrifices during the bad times, and they feel that if we make these painful reforms, then life will get better, then, um, then people do accept the pain. And aren't you afraid to face uh, rejection from old mindsets? Uh, people will be, you know, uh, uh, afraid of what's coming, what's coming, what's new coming. Uh, yes, uh, it, it, there is a possibility. You know, when you have pain, people, and the, especially the status quo. The main resistance we will face is from the status quo, which means the people who've been benefiting from a corrupt system. We, they're already making a lot of noise right now. Uh, it's a small class, but it's powerful. And uh, they will try everything to sabotage the reforms. But you see, uh, I, I feel that people of Pakistan are ready. They have seen what has happened in Pakistan in the last 10 years when corruption has destroyed state institutions, when we have gradually gone deeper and deeper into debt. Uh, Pakistan uh, debt is unprecedented. So to correct that, every country which, has, which wants to correct that situation has to go through a painful period of reforms. So uh, when, you, when you go through this pain, you can make it easier by, by share, people sharing the pain. And the only challenge is then you take on the status quo. You do not allow them to cash in on this situation where people are going through pain. And then normally they, they would reverse the process. So, uh, you know, you have a revolution. People get tired of a system. They revolt. But sometimes there's a counter-revolution. The status quo comes back. What we have to be careful is that the people who brought Pakistan to the state should never be ever able to come back and again do what they did to our country. How clear is the vision to the new generation, the majority of, of the Pakistani people? And how are they understanding it? How are they taking it? I think uh, this is the, the strength of Pakistan. We have the second youngest population in the world. And when you have 60% uh, 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 of Pakistanis under the age of 30, that means that you have an idealistic population. They are the, this is the youth is what made me win the elections against the status quo. And it's the youth which uh, we will, we will uh, inspire and mobilize to help us in this reform program. And I think that if they, you know, uh, 
uh, already they are behind us. And w once the, as we start our reform program, we will communicate to the public exactly what steps we are doing. And if you have the young people with you, forefront of change anywhere in the world are the young people. And since Prince Mohammed bin Salman is in uh, Pakistan, how similar is Near Pakistan to Prince Mohammed bin Salman's uh, or the, the Saudi new vision of 2030? Um, so we are on the same page as far as corruption goes. Prince Salman is trying to modernize uh, uh, Saudi, uh, 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 Prince Mohammed is trying to modernize uh, Saudi Arabia. Much needed reforms. Uh, and uh, I have uh, I've shared uh, some of the things we are doing and what he's doing. And I think it's very impressive. We wish him all the luck because we want Saudi Arabia to get stronger and uh, reform Saudi Arabia with, with universities and colleges and young people who, who can compete with the world in the 21st century. And are there any uh, kind of uh, uh, mutual understandings on both uh, reform? Uh we, you see, we are different in the sense that Saudi Arabia is a rich country. Uh, they have this oil wealth. Pakistan is actually a very rich country, but at the moment, having a huge population, we are 210 million people. Saudi Arabia is a much smaller country. And with this huge population, we have different challenges. Our biggest challenge is to develop our human beings. Saudi Arabia has different challenges. I think what they need is to make uh, people uh, wean off their uh, just living of oil. And, and that's what I think um, is happening uh, by what Prince Mohammed is doing in Saudi Arabia. Uh, what we have are different challenges. We have, to edu we have to develop our human resources, spend money on education, on health, uh, on skills, skill development, so that uh, young people can be employed. We want employment for our young people. And then we want to develop our resources, tourism being one. We have vast mineral resources here, but we haven't had the investment kept in, 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 uh, in ex excavating these uh, mineral resources. So we have different challenges, but the idea is the same to reform the countries. So obviously uh, the corruption is really uh, giving you a hard time here. No, corruption, uh, the reason why countries uh, lag behind other countries is corruption. Because what corruption does is it destroys the state institutions. I cannot be corrupt if I'm in power I cannot be corrupt unless I destroy the institutions be, uh, below me. So in destroying state institutions, not only uh, that's the only way I can make money, but not only do I make money, everyone else makes money. And people get robbed. So, and the money that should be spent on human beings gets siphoned off into foreign bank accounts and offshore accounts. So that's how countries stay behind. And then merit disappears. There's no meritocracy because if I want to rob a, a country, I need weak institutions. I can only have weak institutions if I put corrupt and inefficient people on top of these institutions. Mm -hmm. So as they say, the Chinese say, the fish rots from the top. Once you have a corrupt elite, then they corrupt the whole system. And that destroys the, the potential of a, of a nation. Mr. Khan, Islamabad, the city that I have seen, is beautiful. The streets are so beautiful and they're so clean. The, you have the great weather as we were talking at the very beginning. What does Pakistan need to attract tourists to this beautiful country? Uh, pa Pakistan um, uh, is going to uh, attract tourists because you see the world has been changed by social media. Pakistan already has uh, in the last three years our tourism has doubled, tripled although it's not much from world standards, but compared to what it was three years ago, it's, it's just gone up three times. It's because of social media. What happens is people come here and we have probably the best mountain scenery anywhere in the world. You can't compare Switzerland to Pakistan. Pakistan mountain scenery is unparalleled. And what happens is, and these places were not known to the tourists. So when people go to these places, they have this mobile phone which has changed the world and social media. They, they post these pictures on their Facebook and then people see these uh, 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 northern areas and other places. 
And that's what has sparked of tourism. We haven't promoted tourism in Pakistan. It's just that Facebook and social media has, has just, uh, st uh, because of that tourism has tripled. But what now we are going to do is have proper tourism with organized tourism where we will have, uh, 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 we will be able to display on our, on our website all the tourist sites. We have religious tourism in Pakistan, we have Buddhism, Buddhist sites, Sikh, probably the most sacred sites of the Sikh religion, of Hinduism, of Sufism, uh, and their ancient uh, places, sites for these religions. We have best mountain scenery, we have coastal tourism, a uh, thousand kilometers of coastal, untouched uh, coastal tourism. And then we have historical tour tourism, like um, Pakistan is, has the, uh, the one of the oldest civilizations, the Indus Valley civilization is five years, 5,000 years old. We have cities like Lahore, Karachi is, uh, not Karachi, but Lahore, Multan, and Peshawar are some of the oldest cities. So it has, it offers different things to different tourists, but we've never promoted it before. Now we are organizing it and we will pr promote it properly through our website, through advertisement so that people know they'll be able to book places where they want to go and they will know exactly if whoever is interested in a particular type of tourism, we will be able to provide them guides. Minister Chaudhary of, of the uh, Minister of Information uh, gave a, a, a very interesting statement when he said, Pakistan is changing from the heaven of terrorists into the heaven of tourists. How far do you think you can succeed in, in implementing that slogan? Uh, with uh, things changing in Afghanistan, this area will become as peaceful as it was, always was before the, uh, before the Afghan Jihad started. Uh, until the Soviets came into Afghanistan and then the Mujahideen went and trained and went and fought in the Afghanistan in the 80s, before that Pakistan was one of the most peaceful countries in the world. We never had any terrorism in Pakistan. We, we, we never had the sort of extremism which came after uh, uh, the 80s, but specifically after 9-11. So, uh, but that was because of what happened in Afghanistan. As Afghanistan moved towards peace, I think uh, this area will settle down and become like what it was before uh, the 80s. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, going across quickly the, 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 the Pakistani media, there's a lot of harsh criticism uh, self-criticism for the Pakistan, for Pakistani government. Don't you think that the Pakistani media plays a great role in giving the wrong impression about Pakistan? It is unfortunate. What, what has happened in Pakistan, we had this big um, split in Pakistan. Uh, there was a, uh, since 2014 uh, in Pakistan, public opinion became divided into two camps. One was this reform camp which wanted change, led by our political party, and the other one was uh, what the old status quo, the old political parties uh, and their supporters. So this divide took place. And in the last three years, it has been a very a big struggle. Very rarely that is there a democratic change like there was in Pakistan. Normally, if you have an entrenched status quo, you cannot remove it through democratic means. It's either a bloody revolution or a military coup. This was the only time that this political struggle removed the status quo. So we still have, uh, you know, the remnants of the, the other camp who are now trying to, as I said, counter-revolution. They want the power back. And so you see this uh, acrimony in the media, but this won't last long. This is, you know, I, I give it maybe six months, a year, a year and a half, and then things will settle down. And probably they'll be busy with something more useful for the country? It'll, it'll settle down because, you know, as Pakistan moves ahead, Pakistan is now moving ahead, investors are coming in here, visa regime has opened up, 60 countries can get a visa on arrival, which never happened before. Including Saudi, I think. Including Saudi, of course, of course Saudi. And so things are changing here now. So these remnants of the status quo uh, will be left far behind. Mr. Prime Minister, my favorite question is for the last, of course. And 
I, 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 you were a sportsman. You were the captain of the Pakistan cricket team. You're a sports legend. I attended one of your games when I was a small kid. And now from a sports legend to a political leader, is politics a fast run or an accurate strike? Politics um, is a struggle. There are two types of politics. One, you can do a normal type of politics, which happens in England, you know, very civilized politics. You go there and you, you know, say nice things and, and so on. You know, it's, it's not, it's a very, it's, it's a civilized politics where you have a conservative, you know, one point of view and then you have another point of view and then they debate and they go home. Um, Pakistan is a struggle between, um, you know, Pakistan was a state where an elite, a corrupt status quo had captured Pakistan, which is why a rich country like Pakistan is uh, in this economic situation. So therefore, here it was a struggle. I struggled for 22 years, and I would not have been able to struggle had I not learned how to struggle on the sporting field. Because sports teaches you how to fight. It teaches you how to struggle. It teaches you how to win. And then it teaches you how to take a loss, how to lose with dignity, and how to learn from defeat. So no other, none of my opponents were equipped like I was to fight, to struggle. Because I learned it the hard way, international sports, it's ruthless. You're up against the best in the world. So I, I had that struggle behind me. Otherwise, I could never have struggled in politics like I did for 22 years. Mr. Prime Minister, thank you very much for this great interview. Thank you.